Good morning, Imago family. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continually be on my lips. We invite you to glorify God with us as we exalt his name today. Let's sing together 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. We sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. We sing the sun comes up. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, your rich in and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Cause you are good. Good, oh, yes, you are good, good, oh, yes, you are good, good, oh, yes, you are good, good, oh, let the king of my heart. Imago Day community. My name is Ruben Alvarado and I'm the associate pastor of Local Outreach. 
Whether you're here with us in person today or participating from home, welcome to church. Eastside is now streaming their services live at 10 a.m. every Sunday. If you've missed this week, a recording of each live stream is also available on Eastside's YouTube channel, including updates related to Eastside's community. You can find the link to access Eastside's live stream at idcpdx.com slash Eastside Sundays. On June 26th, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., Amago Day Central City and Eastside are partnering with Solve and churches throughout Portland for a citywide cleanup effort. The City of Portland asked churches to show up to help in this community effort. So Central City will be partnering with our friends at City Team to do cleanup along Grand Avenue, while Eastside will be partnered with Mana House Church and will meet at Eastside to clean around their neighborhood in Southeast. I really hope you can join us on June 26th as we serve our neighborhoods by cleaning up trash together. We are limited on spaces, so please register fast at idcpdx.com events. The Eastside's Women Group is planning a day of outdoor fun with crafts, lawn games, summer treats, and more. So stop by our Eastside campus for a few minutes or stay the entire time on Saturday, June 12th from 3 to 5 p.m. for some summertime fun. You can find more details at idcpdx.com events. And last but not least, we're excited to share that Gina Siegel is our newest addition to the pastoral team at Imago Day Community. Gina has been on staff as the Director of Women's Formation since 2012, and many of you have been blessed by Gina's spiritual giftings as a leader and a mentor. Gina feels called, and our leadership has affirmed that call as we've watched Gina lead with her gifts throughout the years. She has spent a year and a half with Pastor Rick getting formal and informal training. During that time, she prayed and listened to the call to be a pastor, and we are so thankful Gina feels called to lead with the pastoral team at Imago Day. As a pastor, she will continue to serve in the areas of discipleship and formation. I personally couldn't be happier for Gina. Her call and gifting are so clearly pastoral. Over the years of getting to know her, I've seen how Gina loves and follows Christ with honesty, humility, and deep conviction. And she loves you all dearly. Gina, we love you too. Amago family, would you please be intentional in keeping Pastor Gina and her family in your prayers as they enter this new season. Hey, Imago Day, it is good to be with you today as we continue our series in Genesis, uh, this series, Sojourners Walking by Faith. Uh, as we enter into June, this is the last month of our fiscal year, and as we enter into this month, we need about $550,000 to meet our year-end budget here at Central City. And so, Couple things I'd ask you to do is pray. Pray that God would provide uh, as he has every year. And then the second, would you consider a year-end gift to Imago? This has been a year unlike any other year that we've had, and yet God has been faithful and you have been faithful and generous, and we've been able to help uh, countless people through our COVID relief fund and Advent offering and fire relief. So many needs this year that you have stepped up to. And we have one more, and that is to meet the year-end budget, which allows us to go into the next year uh, strong and doing all the ministry that God has called us to do. Uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. Last week, we began to look at the life of Abraham and Sarah. In this series on walking by faith, we have looked at how, in many ways, God is remaking the world post-pandemic. Um, and in many ways, God is remaking the church. And in that world, God is inviting us to, to walk by faith in a deeper way. And so last week, we looked at the text because Abraham and Sarah are sort of the Bible's, you know, chief example of what it means to walk by faith. And we saw that God called them to go and they left everything behind and they went and they obeyed God. And God had promised them that he would do the impossible to this uh, elderly couple without children, that he was going to turn them into a great nation and give them 
a great land. And so they went. And we learned that in this journey of walking by faith, uh, the main thing is to go where God calls. And when God calls, God covenants that he, he promises himself based on his own character to show up and to do what only God can do, which is the impossible. And our job is to walk by faith. And we talked about the fact that God is not interested in creating faith events for us, but he wants to create a life of faith, uh, a life that begins and is filled in the middle and ends with faith everywhere in between. And that by faith, God is forming us into the image of his son. And so today we pick up a couple chapters later in Genesis 15, this is one of the strangest texts, I think, perhaps in the whole Bible, and yet one of the most meaningful texts when you really understand what's going on. And so let's jump in, uh, chapter 15, verse 1, and it says this, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid. I am your shield and your very great reward. We have to ask the question, what, is, what has happened? It says after this. And what we find in chapters 13 and 14 is that Abraham immediately runs into trouble. Uh, this walk of faith is a walk that is not an easy journey. As him and Sarah begin this journey of faith, they realize there is, these are hostile conditions. There's a discrepancy between him and Lot on where they're going to live. They need to separate from each other because their herds have grown too big. There are other kings that have come and taken Lot, and Abraham has to go to rescue him, and his life is threatened. And one of the very early lessons in Abraham and Sarah's walk of faith is that the walk of faith is taking place in hostile conditions. For you and I, that means that we are walking by faith in a world, in a land that only walks by sight. The Bible tells us that that we have these enemies against us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so whenever we are called to live this life of faith, we live it in hostile conditions. And in those hostile conditions, we are often afraid. One of the most often repeated command in the Bible is, do not be afraid. And so now Abraham has been journeying with God for some time, and he's experienced not only God's call and God's covenant, but also God's rescue. And yet the impossible is still before him. He still doesn't have children. He still doesn't have land or a home. And he now knows that there are other kings and other peoples who are against him who seek his life. And God comes to him in a vision and says to him, don't be afraid. I am your shield and your very great reward. Meaning that God is the one who will protect Abraham on this journey, and God is the reward of Abraham. In other words, the promises of God often drive us, and that's really, really important. We want God to complete the good work that he began in us to never leave us or forsake us. All those promises of God are beautiful things, and they motivate us to walk by faith. But the point of this walk of faith is not to get the gifts of God or the promises of God, but to get the God of the promises and the God of the gifts. God is the reward of faith. God himself is our reward. And one of the things that happens in this journey of faith is that what we see is Abraham becoming God-aware 
seeing God, trusting God, counting on God, walking by faith, but also becoming self-aware. Self-awareness is one of the keys to the Christian life, to understand ourselves, our weaknesses, our liabilities, our propensities, the ways in which we're prone to wander. And so he speaks back to God, and he says to him in verse 2, But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir, which was the custom of that day. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a close relational thing where Eliezer was just his beloved friend, and so he left his inheritance. It was uh, the way that it worked. His servant would receive everything, and that was a transactional relationship. And what a Abraham understands is his own limitations, that as God comes to him and says, don't fear, I'm your shield, I'm your reward, Abraham also is aware that in and of himself, he does not have the ability to accomplish the promises that he is called to live into. God, what will you do for me? What can you give me? You've talked about these promises. You've talked about offspring and nation and land, but I don't even have kids. I'm so glad that Abraham talks back to God. I think for many of us, we have this picture of the patriarchs and the Old Testament characters as these sort of people of faith that are almost unreal, they're almost mythical, and yet what we find is they are absolutely very human. They are absolutely just like us. And, and one of the, the important things to recognize is that as we walk by faith and we are walking where the Lord shows us to go, that we're walking in this intimate connection with God, that we're in conversation with God, and God welcomes our questions, welcomes our doubts, welcomes our confusion. Some of you grew up in very fundamentalist contexts where you aren't allowed to question, you're not allowed to have a doubt, you're not allowed to bring anything up, and that is so far removed from what we find in Scripture when it comes to walking by faith. What we find in Scripture is men and women who are honestly crying out to God, honestly talking to God, honestly questioning God. And I'm so glad Abraham does it because I've done it. I do it all the time. As, as I get to know God more, I also get to know myself more and my own weakness and liabilities. The longer we walk on this journey of faith, the bigger God gets, but also the more we become self-aware of our own limitations and our own weaknesses. And so Abram asked the question, God, how, how can this happen? In other words, what can you, how can you give me all these things that you're promising me when I don't even have a child? And then the word of the Lord comes to him and he says, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside he said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. God takes Abraham out on a night walk in his journey, and he says, look up at the stars. And he looks up, and there are no city lights there. If you've ever been out like on Larch Mountain or some of those places where you're far removed from the city and you see that there are way more stars up there than we recognize down here in the city. And he says, look up at those stars and see if you can count them, if you can even possibly do that. And he says, that's what your offspring are going to be like. You are going to have your own son from your own flesh and blood, and, it is going to, and, the, and your offspring are going to be numerous, like more than the stars. And the lesson 
isn't just that the stars are beautiful or that the stars are numerous, but that the God who a few chapters ago spoke those stars into being is the same God who has promised Abraham and Sarah that he will make them into a great nation. When you and I are in those moments where we come against our own weakness, our own inability, it's important that in those moments that we look up and out of ourselves on this walk of faith. And that we recognize that the God who spoke all of this into being is the same God who has promised to complete the good work that he started in us, to form us into the image of the Son, to never leave us or forsake us, and to bring us into his presence, holy and resurrected. And when we can get up and out of ourselves into the God that stands behind the creation, it gives us the confidence to go, if he can do all of that, then he surely can do the impossible in my life. And it says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. In other words, Abraham didn't do anything spiritual or moral to be righteous, but his faith was credited to him as righteousness. He lifted up his part of the covenant, which was to respond to God, not by perfection, but by faith. And that phrase that believed the Lord and he was credited to him as righteousness shows up in Paul's writings, when it comes to our faith in Jesus, that when we put our faith in Jesus crucified, resurrected, and ascended, that it is credited to us as righteousness. Paul talks about it in Romans 4 and Galatians 3, and James talks about it, that our belief, and it's not just that cognitive sort of Yes, uh, two plus two is four, but it is a belief that walks, that obeys, that follows, that that belief that, God, you're going to do what you said you would do. I believe it, and now I'm going to continue to walk despite my liabilities, despite my weaknesses. I'm going to quit trusting in myself and begin to put all my hope and trust on you. And God says, I call that righteous. You are made righteous in my sight by faith. That is the walk of faith, that we aren't becoming righteous because of what we do, but we are credited as righteous because of who we believed in. And there is such a massive difference between that. When Uh, One of the major issues with this walk of faith is that if we don't become God-aware and self-aware, what we tend to do is to become self-righteous. We begin to just examine our behaviors and we try to uh, perfect this walk of faith by doing everything right. Did I pray enough? Did I read enough? Did I serve enough? Whatever it is. And we begin to trust in those things. And those things, while they're good in and of themselves, they will never make you righteous. And so we can actually behave very religious and not be walking by faith. We can just behaving by religious rules. And and, and so this walk of faith is an intimate walk with God where we begin to trust not in our own goodness, but in the one who is good towards us. And that is what God calls righteous, believing in the one who is righteousness in and of himself. And so there is the promise made that Abram can trust that this God, who is his shield and his reward, will also be the God that gives him offspring through his own flesh and blood. And then God said to him, I am the Lord 
who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. So he says, I'm going to make you a nation through your flesh and blood offspring, and that nation is going to live in this land that I have brought you to to take possession of it. And again, Abraham talks back to God. Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? How can I know? How can I know? Again, he recognizes that he's in a land full of people and armies and kings, that in and of himself, he has no chance of taking possession of this land that God says, I'm giving this to you. Uh, Abraham is God aware and in that awareness, he can talk to God and share his insecurities and his frustrations and know, what if I can't keep up my end of the bargain? How can I know that I'll take possession of it? Those are important questions for the walk of faith. What we see here is not a man who is mastering the spiritual life by, by himself, but is becoming a master of the faith in conversation, in relationship with God, in laying those big questions out to God. God, how can I be sure? How can I know? How are you going to do this? I don't see it, God. Do you talk to God that way? Do you have the kind of relationship with God where you can say to him, God, I know that you said that you'll show up in this moment, but I I don't know. I don't see it, God. How can I know for sure? Have you been through this last year during the pandemic and been close enough to God to say, God, how can I know that you are going to do what you've promised to do when everything I see, I've lost my job, we've lost family members, we see the world uh, look so strange and so scary. And here you are, my shield and my great reward, and you've promised to bring me through, to never leave me, never forsake. But how can I know, God? It's important that the, the faith of Abraham 4,000 years ago is the kind of faith that we're supposed to have today, the kind of faith that talks honestly to God and says, God, I don't see it. I don't see it. And so the Lord said to him a very weird thing. He says, bring me a heifer and a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Now, we have, I have no idea. We have no idea why he's saying that, but Abraham does. He brings them, and Abram brought all these to him, and he cut them in two, and he arranged the halves in opposite to each other and the birds, and he didn't cut the birds in half. And then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. Now, what in the world is happening here? In, the, in that day, which Abraham was very aware of what was happening, um, when a contract or a covenant was ratified, they didn't do it by signing their signature. Right. If if they looked at us today, you know, when you buy a house, you sign a signature. When you get married, you you say wedding vows that mean nothing legally until you sign that piece of paper. And when you sign the piece of paper, bam, then it's ratified. Those vows become ratified and your signature is the thing that that is testifying, that is basically ratifying that I will do what I've signed on to. Well, if, if the culture of that day looked at us, they would say, that is so weak. I mean, w what happens to you if you don't follow through with your commitment that you signed on to? What happens if you file bankruptcy or leave your spouse? Nothing happens to you. In that day, and I shouldn't say that, like, yes, those are horrible things. Things happen to you. But in that day, it was much more severe. What they would do is they would cut the sacrifices in half, 
And then the king, if the king was ratifying a covenant with, let's say, an underlord or a property owner, they would both walk through these cut up animals. They would walk between the aisle, down the aisle between the cut up animals. And they would essentially say, if I do not do what I have committed to do, may it do be done to me that I am cut in half and the birds of prey will eat my carcass. <laughs> I, I know it sounds extreme, but that was that was standard fare in that day. We see it in Jeremiah, uh, a really sad time in Israel's life where God was, uh, God was condemning Israel because they were not releasing their slaves during the year of Jubilee. And so when they heard that God was going to, to enforce the covenant, they ratified a covenant to God. They cut the animals in half and they walked through the middle and they said, may it be done to us if we do not release our slaves on the year of Jubilee. And they released them, but then they went back on their word. And God says in Jeremiah verses 34, verse 18, those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two when they walked between the pieces. And that's how this covenant was seen. And so what would happen is the king would walk through and then the underlord or the servant would walk through and that would ratify the commitment or just the servant would walk through. The king would never just walk through by himself. It's so important that we understand what's happening here. And Abram understood what was happening. And so he goes and he cuts up the heifers and the goats and the rams. And he prepares for the ratification of this covenant. The writer of Hebrews explains a little more about what's happening here in Hebrews 6. And it's about the certainty of God's promises. It said that when God made his promise to Abraham in verse 13 of chapter 6, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. And so because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purposes very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did it so that two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, and we would take hope that is set before us and be encouraged. Verse 19, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. So what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that when God covenanted with Abram, what he did was he made an oath, he ratified the covenant himself because there is no one greater than him that he can swear by. And we get this illustration that God's promises and God's covenant are unchanging and they are, they are purposeful and true so that we can have hope and be encouraged. And he uses the illustration that we can have this hope as an anchor of our soul. Like what God said he's going to do, he will do. And it's an anchor of to our soul. The thing <clears throat> about an anchor, right, is that when a, when a ship has an anchor, they use it to set it down so that the, as the currents go back and forth in the sea, the ship doesn't get tossed to and fro. But it only works when it goes deep down all the way to the bottom and it launches itself into the rocks. And when it's lodged into the rocks, it holds the ship 
when the currents are going back and forth. And Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews, is saying that do you have that kind of hope in God that goes all the way down, that the anchor goes deep, deep down into the very character of God so that your life doesn't get swayed to and fro. In other words, an anchor that's only halfway down doesn't do you any good. It has to go all the way down. And why is that? Well, it's because this walk of faith is a walk of faith in hostile conditions. The life that we live is a life that is always threatened, whether it's financially, whether it's uh, what, what, you know, physically, whether it's health, like there's always threats. And if our faith is just, if that anchor, in other words, we've set our heart just kind of partially in God, then that anchor will not hold. We have to put it all the way down into the very nature and character of God that it's his promises and his word and his faithfulness because the dark night of the soul will come. And unless our anchor is secure, that ship will float off into any direction. And that's your life. If you want to live a life of faith, that can make it from beginning to end, continually growing and being formed, and is beautiful, is big, a big life of faith, then you have to set that anchor all the way down into the very nature and character of God. And that's what we see that happens is Abram brings all these pieces and the sun begins to set. Abram falls into a deep sleep. And a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated thereby. I will punish that nation they serve as slaves. And afterward they will come out with a great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The Amorites are the Canaanites. And so Abram has this dark night of the soul, that darkness that falls over him. And it's a darkness that is so dark. It's like if you're in a house that's on fire and it's just so thick, um, that you have to like go down all the way to the bottom to get just little bits of oxygen down there. That's the darkness that's here. Or if you've ever um, been in a situation where you were just feeling so de depressed or so so challenged to, to, to even hope for another day, that's the moment that Abram's in. And it's in those moments that God is there in the darkness as well. Dreadful, thick. And God tells him the story of what's going to happen to his people. He says, Lord, how can I know? And the Lord says, well, if you really want to know, I'll show you. But, but it's not all beautiful. It's not all roses. In this world, life is going to be very hard. You're Family will be enslaved, but they'll come out with plunder. They'll finally take this land, and you're going to go to sleep in peace. Those dark nights that we need, that anchor of our soul to know that God, no matter what the news is, good, bad, or ugly, I need to know that you're there. I need to know that you're going to show up for me. Do you have your anchor there? Is it down deep in God? And then a very strange verse, verse 17. It says, when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. 
And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates to the land of the Canaanites, the Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gigershites, and the Jebusites. Well, what's happening here? We don't really know what the torch and the fire pot symbolize. But what we do know that throughout the Old Testament, God is always, his presence is always in the thick smoke and the fire. We see Moses at a theophany uh, at the burning bush. It's a blazing fire. We see them when they're encamped in the wilderness that there is a pillar of smoke and there is fire by night. So what is happening here is the Lord himself is ratifying the covenant. The Lord himself is walking between the pieces. And he's saying, essentially, that if I don't do, Abram, what I have promised you I will do, may I lose my omnipotence and be like one of these broken rams. May I lose my all-knowingness and be like this heifer cut in two. May I lose everything that I am as God if I don't hold up my end of the covenant. Now what's interesting is that Abram doesn't have to walk through. God is walking through on behalf of Abram as well. Basically, Abram, being self-aware, has been saying to God, how can this happen, God, when I don't have kids? How can I know that this land is going to be mine when I can't take on these kings and the people in this land? And God says, you can know because by my own character, by my own word, I swear by God himself, he takes the oath and says, I will do it. But also, Abram, if you don't keep up your end of the covenant, I will pay that punishment too. See, it's not based on whether we do good or bad, but on the God that we believe in. Abram, if you aren't enough, as you know you're not enough, it's okay. I will suffer your weakness, your failure. That'll be on me too. The kings never did this. It was always the king that walked through and then the servant that walked through. Or the servant walked through and the king didn't walk through. But here we have the God of the universe walking through this ancient covenant saying, I swear by myself that if I don't do what I said I'm going to do, may I lose all my deity and be like these animals. But also, Abram, if you don't hold up your part of the covenant, then I will suffer that as well. And what we know is that years and years later, in Mark chapter 15, it says that from noon to three, the sky went dark. And Jesus hung on a cross and he cried out, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, God did that. God did take on our flesh. God did get broken in half. God did give up his omnipresence and took on our humanity. And he suffered on a cross and he's Blood was poured out and his body was broken and he hung there to die before the birds of the air. Why? Why would he do that? So that you and I can be credited as righteous. So that he would not only keep up God's covenant towards us, but he would satisfy our part of the covenant as well. 
and he suffers the wrath of God so you and I can be made righteous. You see, that's the God that you and I are called to. Can you, can you see that, God? Can you let that image of Jesus sink down into the depths of your heart and to be an anchor in your soul? Right? You have all kinds of questions. Well, what about science? Well, what about that? Just let that kind of stuff go and look to Jesus right now. Because if you want to know what God's like, you look to Jesus. And that is your God. The God who would walk through the covenant, not just for himself, but also for you, and pay the penalty when we can't keep up our end of the promise so that you and I might be made right. That is the God that invites you to walk by faith. That is the God that is your shield and your reward. That is that Jesus that you need to let in, not just kind of in, but all the way down to the bedrock of your life where that anchor can hold no matter what happens no matter the questions that you have, the limitations that you have. And so what I would encourage you today is if you're in that place, to ask God, God, how can I know? How can I know? Don't be afraid to ask the hard question. God, how can this be when this is what's going on in my life? How are you gonna do it, God? He's there, he's present with you, he'll show you. But would you dare to focus on Jesus just enough to realize how good he is, how loving he is, how he held up our part of the covenant that we could never hold up so that God could be all that God is to you and you could be credited as righteous, right? Let that, let that build hope in you. Let that encourage you let that be the anchor right that is at the bedrock of your life so that no matter what happens on this walk of faith the world the flesh the devil no matter what may come we know that God will get us through and our life is anchored to the crucified and resurrected king Jesus Christ amen
the verse again together. You give life, yeah. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Come on, sing it out. Oh. 